David the Great. All stories need a hero, and the national story is no exception. When I was a child, British history was a seamless narrative of British heroes in stirring tales. And I didn't bother much then about the accuracy of the sources or whether they existed at all. I just responded to the characters. And I wasn't entirely wrong, because as I've got older, I realised that the important thing about heroes is not so much who they are, but who we need them to be. We talk about looking up to heroes, but we're actually projecting onto them our current obsessions and passions. It's this malleable quality that means Alfred could serve so many different ages in so many different ways. In the 18th century, Britain was embracing enlightenment, not enchantment. Science, not superstition. Alfred, though now nearly 900 years old, was still going strong and about to be reinvented again for a whole new generation of political players. King George II loved the army. He was the last British king to lead troops into action. He wanted to see Britain on the battlefield, preferably slaughtering the French. But his son, Frederick, Prince of Wales, had other plans. He had a vision of Britain conquering the globe from the high seas. Frederick hated his father and everything he stood for. So he set up a rival court here at Clifton in Buckinghamshire with his allies, the Patriots. So to be a Patriot means that you espouse the sort of true values of Englishness, which at this time is seen as Protestantism, liberty, commercial expansion and a sort of maritime navy. Alfred becomes the, the Patriot's idea of what a true king should be. So he's charismatic, he's dynamic, he appeals to his people, most importantly, he's visible. The young Frederick, who is the young Prince of Wales, he's got new ideas, he wants a new way of looking at things. Why does he go backwards to Alfred? Innovation and modernity is a dirty word in the 18th century because it implies uh, a sort of a, a creativity of a, a f playing fast and loose with the rules. Whereas what you need to do is you need to be able to paint innovation as restoration of a previous idea. These chaps, the Patriots, they find in Alfred an, a mirror and an image of everything that they want themselves to be. And that's his power. That's his potency. Is what you see is these... Um, these men looking back into the English past to find what they want the future to look like. Frederick decided to make some noise about Alfred. Music and theatre were the mass media of the age, an ideal way to transmit a political message. So in 1740, Frederick commissioned the composer Thomas Arne and the poets David Mallet and James Thompson to write Alfred a mask. This would show his father what a true king should be. principally revolves around a blind bard, a couple of fairies, and some peasants spouting political slogans. It would probably have been long forgotten, were it not for one rather memorable tune. When Britain first at hands command... Alfred had built a few ships and fought a few sea battles against the Vikings. But once Frederick and his songwriters had finished with him, he'd become the founder of the all-conquering Royal Navy. 
This was the charter, the charter of the land, and guardian angels sang the strain. became Britain's unofficial national anthem. And 270 years later, there's nothing more patriotically, tub-thumpingly British than this hymn to Alfred and the sea. As the 19th century dawned, Alfred's star remained high. But in an age of romanticism, Arthur would be born again. His new birthplace, from where he would reconquer the world, was his alleged original home, Wales. The great heyday of South Wales industrial might is itself an olden day's memory now. Its mines and factories overgrown ruins. But in the early 19th century, Wales was undergoing a staggering transformation. Many people worried that because of industrialisation, an ancient culture was going up in smoke. Some of those who were most concerned were the very people who were driving change. Lady Charlotte Guest was an Englishwoman, the wife of one of the most successful iron makers in Wales. In 1837, she began translating a series of medieval Welsh tales, the Mabinogion. Arthurian legends were at its heart. Then said Arthur, it were well for thee, Gurhir Gwal Stoutli Thoif, to go upon this quest, for thou knowest all languages, and art familiar with those of the birds and the beasts. And as for you, Kai and Bedwyr, I have hope of whatever adventure ye are in quest of, that ye will achieve it. What's different about this Arthur that we have in the Mabinogion, compared to the Arthur that we've been presented with before? What's new is uh, the claim for Arthur and Arthurian romance as the Welsh contribution to European literature, the cradle, if you like, of uh, something which did actually affect the whole of European literature. And there's presumably a, an audience that is happy to think, well, Arthur was properly Welsh, he's ours, and we started everything. I mean, this is there is certainly an audience that's very happy to think that, yes, indeed. Why in this period when everyone seems to be looking forward, there's a huge industrial revolution going on, um, why is there this desire to look backwards? It's such a period of rapid change. The demographics of, of this part of Wales are changing so quickly. Old community structures are being broken up. Language is shifting. When things happen too quickly around you, people reach into the past for some kind of security. The idea of things being more under control in the olden days, uh, things being simpler and, and easier. It's ironic, isn't it, that the English wife of a, an English industrialist is trying to help the Welsh rediscover their very early roots. Uh, that, that's it to some extent. But, but it's also, they just love knights. They love dressing up. They like suits of armour. They've got suits of armour all over their houses. And what can you do? Wales was having a big olden days moment. For centuries, its language and literature had been overshadowed by a dominant English tradition. But now, the Welsh were fighting back, keen to prove that their culture was just as olden as anyone else's. So they revived a tradition of ice deadfalls, 
celebrations of music and storytelling from the time of the medieval bards. And then they looked even further back, summoning up a tradition of pre-Roman Druids. This footage is from 1926, by which time these festivals had become a national institution. Here's the future George VI and the Queen Mother joining in the fun. All these would-be Druids needed were appropriately ancient sites to meet in. Guess the date of construction of this circle of standing stones. 3000 BC, 2000 BC, 1000 BC. Try 1850. It was put up by a local enthusiast for all things Druidy, and he ranged his stones around a natural phenomenon, an old glacial boulder in the middle there. But the circle of stones, the design, was modelled on a genuinely old circle of stones at Avebury in Wiltshire. Once it was put up, this did indeed become a place where Eisteddfods were held, and it became a tradition that after you'd held a, a national Eisteddfod in one place, you left behind a circle of stones, some actually made of stones, and in latter days, they were actually made of plastic. So, oddly enough, Wales does now have a genuine heritage of mystical, druidical standing stone circles that dates all the way back to the 19th century. The Celtic past was influential well beyond Wales. Artists like Gustav Doré and Aubrey Beardsley produced works inspired by Tennyson's monumental Arthurian cycle of poems, The Idols of the King. Some of the very first photographs, produced by Julia Margaret Cameron, were portraits and entire tableau inspired by Tennyson's tales. And the pre-Raphaelite painters revelled in Arthurian scenes, with their themes of chastity and sensuality, romance, chivalry and a sense of mission. But Arthur wasn't the 19th century's only muse. There was another story that was endlessly reproduced. Alfred's kitchen catastrophe. This is the classic version of the Alfred Burns the Cake scene done by David Wilkie in 1806. Painters loved doing this particular scene. And one of the reasons was it's a historical painting, but there's a chance to do some comedy. And so, Alfred is depicted literally with a red face. He is embarrassed at having made a fool of himself. And the wife, who is furious and upset, upbraids a man who, though she doesn't know it, is actually the king. The man, interestingly, has a sort of half smile on his face and he's looking complicitly at Alfred. Men, we burn cakes. What do you expect? The depiction of Alfred is changing at this period. This is a more democratic age, and therefore this picture shows him going amongst his people. When he's scolded by the woman, he doesn't say, do you know who I am, I'm the king. He accepts the scolding and he learns from it. And therefore Alfred here is a king who has to acquire the common touch, a king who has to work out how to coexist even with the most humble of his subjects. With the British Empire spread across the globe, the Victorians became ever more confident about their historical self-definition and their national myth-making. For the first time, there was space for Arthur and Alfred to share the light. With his retinue of knights and bevy of damsels, Arthur captured sentimental Victorian hearts. Alfred, on the other hand, appealed to something more muscular. The Victorians were happy to believe Alfred had founded most of the institutions they held dear. Public schools, universities, parliament, the law, the military. Alfred was the founding father the embodiment of everything that was great about Great Britain. 
And so the 1,000th anniversary of Alfred's death was a perfect moment for the good people of Winchester, ancient capital of Wessex, to honour him properly. This was the 1901 millenary. Actually, the anniversary was two years earlier, in 1899, and they'd got the date wrong. But no matter. It was one of those slightly bonkers occasions at which we British excel. It's obviously a, a genuinely popular event. Haven't there people hanging out the windows, lining up on the roofs? Everybody in Winchester had a day off. There were special trains bringing people down from London. It is meant to be a, a sort of hugely popular event to make everybody feel part of the British Empire. So that's a, a Highland regiment, I would think, there. Yes, yes, that's right. There are a lot of um, different units, for, both from the army and the, the navy, taking part. And some of them have been released from service in the Boer War because it was just felt so important. What, to be here? To be here. <laughs> rather than and, on the battlefield. Rather than on the back, yeah, yeah. Oh, now, yes, I love this statue. one. Yeah, this is one of my favourite ones because you've got the uh, sculptor Hamo Thornycroft on the left, and you can see just how big the statue is. Mm. And he got damaged. Yes, he did. Slipped at one point, and his nose got damaged. And they... This isn't what you'd expect from Victorian engineering. <laughs> no, no. Well, you can see it does look a bit ramshackle, <laughs> but they, are, they, they they know what they're doing. You can see he's holding up his sword in a way that would really be rather dangerous. Um, <laughs> he's making a cross with the hilt. Yes, he, a, the he, sword turned into a, a yeah, crucifix. He is fighting on behalf of Christianity, as so he's a sort of Christian military hero. So he ticks all the boxes. Unveiling the statue, the former Prime Minister, Lord Rosebery, did, however, concede that the Alfred we reverence may well be an idealised figure, an effigy of the imagination. He'd hit the nail on the head. The Victorians weren't really saluting Alfred's triumphs, they were saluting their own. As the 20th century opened, Alfred's transformation from historical figure to effigy of the imagination was complete. The poet G.K. Chesterton explained King Alfred is not a legend in the sense that King Arthur may be a legend, in the sense that he may possibly be a lie. But he is a legend in this broader and more human sense that the legends are the most important things about him. In 1911, Chesterton published the last great epic English poem, The Ballad of the White Horse, and Alfred was its hero. It was Alfred who had supposedly cut the ancient white horse into the chalk at Huffington, even though it actually predated him by more than a thousand years. In the poem, the horse becomes a symbol of England itself. Alfred is captured, the horse is left unkempt. But in victory, he becomes its caretaker, clearing it of weeds. This custodial spirit, the poem cautions, would always be needed to defend Britain in times of danger. Thirty years later, when Britain's skies were dark with enemy planes and the horse itself was hidden to disorientate German pilots above, an extract to the poem was printed in the Times. I tell you naught for your comfort, yea, naught for your desire, save that the sky grows darker yet and the sea rises higher. Night shall be thrice night over you and heaven an iron cope. Do you have joy without a cause, yea, faith without a hope? In the Times article of 1941, not only was the poem quoted, but Alfred was directly invoked by the newspaper. It carries a report of a great meeting between ministers of the United Kingdom 
and a string of countries that have been invaded by the Nazis. The Times says the spirit of the gathering was that of Alfred in Athelney. And the speech delivered by Mr Churchill, so far from betraying apprehension or awe of the vast forces of tyranny now trampling over Europe, referred to the German Führer only in terms of burning scorn. Churchill would have loved the comparison to Alfred. He was brought up in the great heyday of the Victorian Alfred cult and would have thought of him as the greatest Englishman of all time. Just as we always invoke Churchill, they always invoked Alfred. And here they are again. Britain is alone, encircled by its enemies and fighting a war that seems impossible to win. So the great Anglo-Saxon warrior is summoned up to inspire not only his own countrymen, but all free people in their hour of need. That was Alfred's high point. After the war, in more uncertain times, such a self-confident king no longer appealed. Unlike the more complex and more equivocal, Arthur. It's the nearest now, confirming this our sacred land. We swear. Since the days of the Grail, Arthur had been associated with mysticism. As Britain experienced a wave of counterculture at the end of the 20th century, he was reinvented once more. Dark Age Arthur became New Age Arthur. Heart to heart and hand in hand, mark O spirit and hear us now, confirming this our most sacred vow. So, how do I address you? Any way you like, as long as it's not too early in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, though, my name is actually Arthur Ruther Pendragon. I'm generally known as King Arthur, and I'm a senior druid from Stonehenge and here in Glastonbury. So is Arthur all right? Oh, Arthur's absolutely fine. But you've got to, you've got to remember there's three Arthurs. There's three Arthurian ages. There's a, there's a pre-Roman archetypal Welsh. There's a post-Roman Dark Age British. And there's a post-Thatcher, and I'm the post-Thatcher. <laughs> right. Are you literally an embodiment of Arthur? I believe I, I believe I am th the same spirit dwells within, but I'm not out to convince anyone that I'm a reincarnation of King Arthur. I'm just out to say, we're King Arthur here now. This is what he'd be doing, and it obviously is because it's what I do. Anything specific at the moment? Um, any, any issues that yeah, specific at the moment Arthur's particularly yeah. worried about? Yeah, what, what we are doing is um, we're marching with the people and the trade unions and we're marching um, against this government because we are uh, against their austerity measures that are designed to claw back money from those who can least afford it to prop up those who least need it. He always fights for the underdog and he always fights for what is fair, right and fair, or as I call it, Truth, honour and justice. It <laughs> makes you sound like Batman. <laughs> <laughs> I got the cloak. <laughs> <laughs> there seems little doubt that Arthur will go on and on. He spawned video games, TV series and films. And today you can even experience him through the medium of online gambling. The fictional king that Geoffrey of Monmouth wrote about nearly a thousand years ago is now a money-spinning global brand. Factual Alfred will always be more prosaic. But he is one of the leading poster boys on Michael Gove's great British history curriculum. And he continues to speak from beyond the grave. Oh, wow! 800 years after canny monks at Glastonbury dug up their royal treasure trove, historical societies and TV documentaries are still playing the same game. Imagine the possibility as we stand here is that, you know, the, the, the life and the legend of Alfred the Great comes down to this. The actual pelvis of King Alfred. Possibly. Or possibly not. The point is, 
Our need to connect with these ancient heroes is still strong. They continue to help us define ourselves. And this process of historical makeover will undoubtedly continue. We will be long gone, but new Arthurs and Alfreds will emerge. As our cycles of need for historical escapism or realism continue, Arthur is still seen everywhere, whereas Alfred is back in the library. But in the past, both of our Dark Age superheroes have been used to comfort, inspire or negotiate change in Britain, and may well be again. Because, looking forwards, my guess is we'll keep looking backwards. The olden days always have a future. I'm now looking forward to more looking back next time, when I'll be discovering how modern Britain is a product of the Victorian obsession with the Middle Ages. Clear?